And I'm going to record this too, just to see here now. What, okay, I was going to show you what happened on Blackboard. Anyway, what I what I will do is if this presentation doesn't work in live, I will try to uh, I'll try to just open the PowerPoints myself and kind of narrate them by recording them on here. And then if you go up to the top left corner of the screen, you'll be able to see uh, there'll be a menu that pops out like this. And if there's recordings, they'll pop they'll pop out here. Um, but I don't even know what the hell's going on here. This thing's a mess. We're going to stop sharing that screen. Uh, stop. Ooh, there we go. Close up of Corey. Okay, I'm going to see if I can get a PowerPoint up here. Um, where the hell's my stuff? There it is. Bear with me here, guys. I'm just trying to get this stuff set up. All right, let's try this again. I guess Derek was all worried because we don't worried. have a webcam. Oh, is that right? Yeah, that's what he was yeah, saying. That's, yeah, that's what he was saying. That's going to be problematic, but I know he's got a phone, so that that works too. We can we'll figure out something to work around that. Uh, okay, let's see here. Are you guys seeing the slideshow here? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let me know if it pops up. You guys should should see it. Nada. Like the list for all the list for all the Yeah, no, still have my document. My document. It should be the PowerPoint. What the hell? Okay, let's see what's here. Now? Oh. Oh. Yes, no? Oh. No, I just see you. Okay. <laughs> uh, share screen. Window. Well, oh, what the hell? What the hell? Morning, Nick. Morning. Yeah, welcome to my nightmare. Having fun. Yeah. Shit, I did this last night and it sort of worked. Share application screen, share files. Yeah, that's not what I want. Share application screen. Well, what the heck? Nothing, hey? What the hell? Oh. Oh, there you go. PowerPoint has detected that your graphics card may not be configured properly for an optimal. <laughs> All right, well, that's awesome. Let's try it anyway. Okay, can we see the PowerPoint now, guys? Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay, well, we'll give this a go. I'm uh, just going to rip through this kind of short and sweet, and uh, we'll see. We'll see how it. Uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so last ILM and PLC is describing mixed language programs, which is a bit of a carryover from the last ILM. Um, 
this one we get into more of the hierarchy of the of the software. So you'll you guys have probably noticed that it's a lot like Windows Explorer with the menu tree on the left hand side and and uh, you know drop down menus and all that kind of stuff. And it's very similar, I guess, also the Blackboard. So that's largely what's in this ILM here. Uh, in the, in our 50 day plan where it says what we're doing for today, it has all the, the key terms that are kind of relevant from this PowerPoint. So that should help you with a little bit of focus. Okay, start out with sequential function chart. This is probably one of the nastier uh, programming languages. It's another graphical language. Um, and it's specifically designed to control processes that uh, consist of steps that are completed in a specific sequence. So uh, when, I'm, when I read that, I kind of think of like batch processes, uh, things like that. So it comprises of basically three uh, pieces, which are uh, represented by symbols, steps, uh, transitions, and orientation links. And we'll see what those look like there. And if you're not using your mic, can you mute your mic, please? Okay, so here's steps. Uh, steps are represented by a, a box with a number in them, and the number is referenced to the step. Um, the difference that you see here in these in these images basically is this box right here. Uh, the first step is always a double box versus uh, the sub subsequent subsequent steps, which are uh, just single outlined. So every uh, SFC program has to start out with one of these double box uh, steps. And then these steps have an action that goes along with them. As you read through the ILM, um, you'll make some sense of uh, what's going on here. But basically, you have a step, a couple of actions that have to be done in order to fulfill that step. And if those actions get fulfilled, that uh, fulfills what's called a transition, which we'll see next, which allows it to proceed uh, into the next step. So here's what one of those transitions uh, look like, represented by uh, a line or a wire that connects the two steps, and then this horizontal line that is uh, the indicator for a transition. It'll have a reference number, and then some type of, again, an activity uh, that allows it proceed to proceed into the next step. Don't worry so much about getting into the details. Uh, of this programming. The, the purpose here is not for you guys to be able to do this. We're just understanding the basic idea of this language and trying to make a, a correlation between this language and the other languages that we've looked at. Okay, orientation links are those wires uh, that connect the steps here. And again, just like any of the other languages that we've looked at, it performs itself. In a, in a scan cycle, so represented in a couple of different ways here, um, coming off the third step and circling back through what they call an orientation link that takes you to the back, uh, back to the front end of the sequence so that it can repeat itself again. Not necessary to do it this way. It can be done by uh, simply putting a number that references back to the first step. So these are the orientation links. So these are all just the basic components uh, that are used in sequential function programming. Okay, Boolean actions, uh, just like we had in ladder diagrams and in uh, function blocks, we're going to have a, a we're going to have Boolean actions here. And sequential function uh, is largely Boolean, but it, it can also uh, do some analog stuff. But it is more ideally suited for uh, Boolean type activities, batch processes, uh, things of that nature. Okay, so all kinds of different variables again. Um, when we look at some of the programs here in SFC, remember that this is a relationship to the same program that we looked at in different languages here. So here you'll notice we have a loop pump uh, and a motor and a stop motor button. So this is a, a classic stop start uh, scenario where we have uh, a motor and a loop pump that either has to pre-loop for a little while uh, before the motor starts and then often will stay running for a little while after the motor stops. So again, if you can understand uh, the process uh, through another language, it helps you interpret what's going on in uh, the new language. So we'll see some things that you might recognize from uh, different languages, such as setting the timer. You need to do this stuff later. Get out of here. Uh, sorry, I just had to. Uh, 
kick my daughter out of the kitchen. She's making too much noise and not making me breakfast. <clears throat> Jade Pulse Actions, uh, spe specifically mentioned here is a pulse action. Basically what you need to know here is that these are executed only once at, at the activation of the step. And you'll see it's kind of a, a mesh uh, between structured text or some type of text programming um, worked within uh, the SFC. Okay, again, another representation uh, motor stop start program here, this time with the, with the counter. So I don't know if we saw uh, an, an exact rep representation of this in a, in a different one, but uh, this is just another, another program. I'm not gonna get too far into. Are you guys still hearing me okay? Somebody respond? Yep. Uh, yep. yep. I hear you good. Yeah, yeah. I hear you good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, non-stored actions here uh, versus the post action here. Uh, and here we're com comparing again structured text version to uh, the version that they, they use in the sequential function ch charts. Uh, non-stored actions again executed over and over again as long as the step is active or it's, it's, it's in its sequence. Um, Non-stored activities are executed, uh, executed every scan cycle, so just like a ladder diagram uh, is continuously scanned, it runs through the scan cycle and uh, gets scanned every single time. So that's non-stored action versus a, a pulsed action, which is only done once per cycle or once per activity. Okay, a couple of important points here on this slide, single divergence and single convergence. Uh, which is, uh, by definition here, is a link from one step to more than one transition. And the thing to take out of these here, uh, we're going to look at this slide, which is a single divergence and a single convergence. We'll look at a, another slide coming up that will be a double divergence and a double convergence. And the thing to remember here is that the single divergence is treated like an OR function. So remember that the single divergence is treated as an OR function. So basically what's happening is we start at step one, we get to this, this transition here, and we're gonna have either this activity coming on or this activity coming on. So single divergence is related to an OR. After the, the step is completed, if it happens to go this way, we converge back into the main program. So here we're diverging are going away and here we're converging or coming back in. So single divergence and convergence is treated like an OR. I, oh, I was hoping that the double divergence would be the next slide, but it's not. Uh, macro steps, this is similar to uh, subroutine, uh, but in SFC. Um, basically what you're doing is you're taking a, a complicated step of programming and you're embedding it into uh, a block. It's still it's still in there. You just don't see it, and it allows the the basically allows the program to look a little bit neater. Okay, so here's a macro step of a, a batch process. So here's the step called batch, and within that step batch, here's what's happening. Uh, I'm filling the tank, so the pump will start once the level gets to be greater than. Uh, two, the next step will come on, the pump will turn off, the heater will start, the mixer will start, timer will time, so it will mix and heat for, uh, for a, a little while until the temperature comes up to, I can't see this very well, but it looks like 80. Once that happens, it will go to the next step, which turns the heater off. Then it will run for another uh, 15 minutes, at which time the mixer will turn off and the drain solenoid will energize and it'll drain up the product. So that's what's going on inside that batch process. So that's kind of the way SFC works. And if you can kind of wrap your head around it, again, it's just another language and another way of doing things, uh, doing things. but that's basically what's going on here. So if you can visualize it uh, in another language or even just visualize it logically, uh, you can kind of translate what's going on here. So pump, set, Basically, it's saying set the pump or push the button on the pump and it's starting. And then where you have R, it's basically a reset. And that's basically turning that bit off or turning the pump off. 
Here's double divergence and double convergence. Again, uh, this uh, definition is almost the same, except instead of being a single link, this is a double link from one transition uh, to more than one step, or a convergence, again, is a multiple link from many steps to the same transition. And the unique difference here between single and double, again, this is treated as an and. So that means that after step one, it's going to do step 100 and also step 200. And you'll notice that both of these by labeling uh, are macros because you don't see any detailed instructions inside of them. So these are macros. And this is the basic kind of stuff that you have to need. You uh, have to recognize. You have to just recognize, okay, well, I don't see any important data written in, the, in these blocks these process 100, 200, so these, these are, are macros. But again, you're not expected to be experts. KSFC uh, actions, are, again, this is more in depth than we necessarily go into, um, but talking about child programs and, and parent programs, uh, again, very similar to a jump to subroutine that we would see in uh, a ladder diagram here. So. Uh, Set the child program means you, you want to run it. Uh, R for reset the child program basically says kills it. Um, minor, uh, you know, just needs no definitions here. Okay, objective two, we move now into uh, structure and hierarchy of, of the software generally. We're done with looking at the individual languages as far as I remember. Okay, so to summarize the languages that we've looked at so far, five of them, ladder diagram, function block, structured text, SFC, and the last one, which we don't actually talk about, is called instruction list. Um, that's all we need to know. These are all 611.31-3 PLC languages. And good little graphic down here, which kind of highlights the uh, best uses or the most common uses for that particular style or language uh, of programming. So this is probably a very, uh, very useful little block of information for you guys in terms of uh, questioning the description uh, of these different languages. So this will highlight uh, application processes. So a good slide to remember. Uh, look, here's a picture. What do I got a picture of here? Basically, the comparison between, I'm going to say, uh, oh, this is telling us that we can use a jump, a jump to subroutine here, and we also got a reference to an SFC program also built into a ladder, di ladder diagram program. So almost all of these languages are interchangeable. So if you're working in a, in a ladder diagram program, you can make a reference to a function block program and you can have a function block program within the same uh, within the same project. Uh, you can have a sequential function chart section in there. You can have a structured text section in there also. And the next lab that we do or the lab that we would have done yesterday uh, would have integrated ladder diagrams, function blocks, and structured text uh, so you can kind of get an idea of the integration of all these different languages together. Okay, getting into program organization now, and this is probably something that should have been talked about maybe in the beginning of the course, because it's really the fundamental structure of most of the software that's out there. Um, almost all software nowadays is built on this Explorer sort of format that we're used to uh, from Windows, and uh, the manufacturers know that, so they kind of go with this format because, you know, most of us are, are familiar with Windows. Uh, so. Within this Explorer tree, as I call it here, we're going to have uh, all kinds of different elements uh, full of folders. Each folder may or may not have uh, subfolders, the ones that we're going to get interested in uh, in terms of PLC programming are, are tasks, and that's what we're going to talk about a lot today, main tasks, periodic tasks, and event tasks, and uh, what defines those. <clears throat> So inside that task folder that we just looked at, uh, there were three folders, uh, and they contained different types of tasks. So um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Uh, a continuous task is executed all the time, so it uses lots of resources, but basically you're cycling through the program continuously every, you know, uh, few hundred or thousand milliseconds. 
This has the, the lowest priority, but it does execute continuously. Uh, the second task is a periodic task, which is uh, set at a, a pre-programmed time, which, you, which we'll see uh, here in, the, in this uh, timing diagram. Continuous tasks. Are, con are continuously happening. So in the 300 millisec millisecond scan time, it'll just keep going around and around and around and around and it'll keep doing. Periodic task in that scan cycle, it's going to do it every 50 milliseconds. So at 50 milliseconds, it'll do it. 100 milliseconds, it'll do it. 150, 200, 250, et cetera, et cetera. That task will get executed in a certain periodic time. The last type of task is called an event, and it is uh, triggered, as the name would imply, by some type uh, of an event, uh, you know, a switch or something going off somewhere, uh, telling it that, ha that it has to do a scan to look for maybe a condition that caused um, this event. So again, uh, be familiar uh, with these kind of uh, timing diagrams because there could be uh, a periodic task like a temperature transmitter uh, 100, for example, is set as a periodic task every couple of minutes. We know that uh, temperatures are slow to change, so there's no need for us to scan a temperature transmitter every 100 milliseconds or 1,000 milliseconds. We can, we can scan a temperature transmitter every 5 seconds or something like that. And the benefit, of course, is that we free up resources uh, for the computer. The computer has all these continuous tasks and all these periodic tasks and all these events, it's going to be busy. So if we can take a, a continuous task and move it into a, a periodic uh, task, that'll save on computer resources. So, so know that uh, you may see drawings uh, like this that might have a diagram here, temperature transmitter or something like that, and the question could say, uh, this task is executed every uh, 100 milliseconds or how often is this task executed and you'll have to be able to look at this and go okay well it happens at 50 and then it happens at 100 and then at 150 the answer might be how often is it done you would say 50 milliseconds so tasks again are used to you know make best use of the of the processing uh, resources if you don't have to scan continuously then you can you can save on some work Okay, file or in, uh, organization here again based on the, the Windows uh, file. It starts out with programs. Uh, we've worked in programs already and we started out basically in a, in a main routine. Uh, and we're, we generally expand from here. Uh, we've been building mostly local tags, which again are, are local to that particular program. Uh, you'll see up here there's something called global tags. Uh, global tags. Um, when we're talking about distributive control, uh, if we make a global tag, temperature transmitter 101, for example, if we make it in this folder, other controllers and users on the network will be able to go in here and grab information from that tag, whereas if we have them down here in a local tag, they'll only be available to that particular program or that particular processor. So that's useful if you have, you know, a plant that's spread out and you've got maybe uh, two or three different trains that do the same thing, for example, and you have main flow coming into the plant or something like that. You'd have main flow uh, coming into the plant as a global tag, and then each of your, your, uh, your trains, you know, your unit one, your unit two, unit three, would have their own little programs uh, located in here with their local tags, but they could call on the main flow in in some of their calculations that they need for um, their programming. Okay, uh, each routine is programmed in one language, and then we use a JSR to call up a subroutine that's in a different language. So within my main routine here, I could uh, have a JSR that calls up a subroutine that's uh, structured text that could be called uh, plant one. I could have a subroutine that's in function block diagram that could be called plant two, and I could have a subroutine uh, called plant three that's written in structured text if it fit my needs. So uh, we can work them all in through this uh, structure in this file organization. Okay, tags, you guys have uh, dealt with already, and software's come a long way 
uh, since I was a, a young man. Uh, now you just basically find your I.O. point and you give it a name, temperature tra transmitter 101, whatever, and then you uh, point it towards a slot and it fills in most of the information uh, for you. Uh, again, program tags, global tags, depending on how many people need to use it. Objective three, uh, describe integration of various field bus devices. So we talked, just started talking about field bus devices and we know that different protocols uh, have different wiring and different capabilities and different speeds, different number of devices that we can use. Uh, starting out with heart, very simple, 15 devices. Then we went to field bus, uh, which was 63 if I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, I can't remember now and then expanding to the top level of their um, device net, which was 255 or something. But we're gonna look at how we integrate these different field buses. And, and what it really basically comes down to is each protocol uh, is unique and they have their own, of course, rules. That's what protocols are all about. So when, when I want to integrate a heart uh, segment into my PLC program, I have to have software and hardware that allows me to connect that technology to my PLC. Same thing if I have foundation field bus. It's going to take some special equipment. Uh, we talked about uh, field bus linking devices and things like that that are unique to for protocols. They all have something that's kind of unique that we need in order to integrate them with our Logix 5000 or our Delta Vs or something like that. So that's what we're going to talk about here in, in this objective. Okay, so again, field bus the digital network that we use uh, for communication with low-level instrumentation devices and low-level they mean you know like transmitters and field devices okay the common ones are the ones we talked about again heart foundation and device net and device net again just some quick review points here open standard up to 63 devices can connect to a scanner I know you guys are gonna say well I think it's up to 255 um, but that that's through a number of scanners you can get there. Um, but the important thing to, to note as we see here again, device that has termination resistors on each end. Um, but something that's unique and what we're kind of highlighting here, and I hope you can see my most pointer is that this card that has an S on it is the device net scanner. And this is really the, the link or the translator between field device network and the processor. So each one of these protocols will have a scanner type of device that is used to translate this communication protocol required by this protocol into usable data that the CPU can use uh, in the programming. Okay, so uh, the device net scanner works, uh, works something like this. We have the scanner module, we have the controller module, and we have our field devices that are out here on our bus. And basically, it goes through a, a scan cycle saying, hey, what's going on with the field device? If anything has changed, that changed uh, changes the values in our input memory of our scanner module. The scanner module will then send that revised data to the CPU. The CPU will use the updated data in our, in our program, regardless of whether it's ladder or function block or, or whatever it is, uses that data, does its activity, changes anything that it needs to, sends information back out to the scanner module, which updates the data table and the output memory of the scanner module, which then sends that data back out to the field devices to update it, and the cycle continues. This is very similar, regardless of what type of protocol that we're gonna talk about. Okay, when we have a scanner, we have to configure it. Um, again, you'll see this in a lab, and it's not complicated. Uh, for example, in the, in the labs that we have done, when you uh, you guys added a analog input module uh, to the Control Logix 5000, we just uh, we just put in a 4 to 20 milliamp input, and we used our uh, little potentiometer, or little board thing there, and we we inputted one to five volts and four to twenty milliamps there, straight analog signal. But in that same configuration window for that analog input card, where we changed the um, the input to zero to ten volts, and we changed our engineering units from one to five to 
to 4 to 20. That same window, there was a little box that some of you might have remembered where it said uh, enable heart device. If we check that box, that would enable that card to be used as a, as a heart scanner, and we would have got all the benefits of using a heart transmitter through that, and then a bunch of other uh, options that have opened up to us. So that falls under configuration, and depending on the protocol, the configuration can, can vary, of course, but basically, uh, same process. First, we're going to upload the current configuration from our controller, and it's always good practice to sit down at the machine first time, start it up, find out where you are, upload it, save it in case you mess anything up, and then uh, proceed. So uh, second step would be defining the properties that are required. So it's a device net, it's a heart, it's a foundation field bus, whatever it is. Uh, you'll be familiar with that type of network and, and you will know what you need. Then we go to the scan list. So what devices are we going to be trying to gather data from? And again, depending on the technology, uh, we watched that video um, where the guy just screwed the wires in there and the software automatically built the scan list. It can be that simple or it can be uh, you know, where just like our, our analog input cards and our, and our digital inputs and output cards there, we can either go and find them in a catalog and we can add them individually, or we have that, that choice where we would left click on the controller and go discover modules. So depending on the software that you're using and, and the protocol and the equipment that you're using, it may be a little bit different, but we're all going to have the same things basically. Up, go, upload where you're starting from determine what you need, build the scan list, and then we download that update to the scanner and then it will act in the way that we want it to. Okay, device net, a uh, particular key note here about device net is that device net fails to its last state. So a separate device uh, status bit, this S will indicate the status of a bit and that's stored within the data table for that input. And basically what happens if you lose power and it comes back on, it's gonna come back into its last state. Um, can be good, can be bad. Uh, you'll see, for example, here, uh, this latch, if it's in its last state latched in and the power comes back on, your level alarm will come back on again. Uh, that's a good thing. However, if this was a, a pump or something like that and it was running when the power went out, and it's latched in, when it comes back on, that pump is automatically going to start running. So you need to be aware of things like that. Okay, we're going to look at heart now. Basically the same, uh, same idea as uh, the device that stuff with uh, the heart twist on it. So again, heart, open protocol, uh, 4 to 20. It is faster uh, in terms of scan times than device net and field bus. And again, the, the reasoning for that is uh, analog is faster. Once we start getting into digital or fully digital or hybrid digital, we add that analog to digital conversion and the digital to analog conversion that slows things down. Um, it also introduces error and you may see, uh, and I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but every component that you add into one of these electronic situations, uh, the analog to digital converter, the digital analog converter, the 250 ohm resistor, they've all got tolerances with them, you know, plus or minus 1% or whatever it is. So that, they all contribute some error into the measurement signal. So uh, that's something to be aware of uh, as we move forward as well. But basically, uh, you know, same basic stuff we've talked about in terms of heart. Okay, point to point again, we know that heart can be point to point. And uh, we move from there, uh, point to point, which we fall under the basic in integration of heart, just using a heart transmitter as an analog transmitter. Second level of the four levels of heart integration is called, what's that noise? You're not, uh, you're not, uh, yeah. what's that? Yeah. The PowerPoint's not up anymore. The PowerPoint's not up anymore. Okay. Did it just stop? Yep. Just that yep. point to point. Just yep. point to point. Okay, good. Let's see here. Uh, okay. 
to come back yet? Did it come back? Yeah, it's back up. Yeah, yeah, it's back up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, if it goes down, you guys let me know because it would be pretty funny if I sat here talking for 10 minutes to nobody. Okay, so uh, back to levels of heart integration. So probably most data in this little section here on heart integration. So basic integration, just using it as an analog transmitter. Uh, we move up from there uh, to basic integration using it with heart IO. There will be slides that will describe these in a little bit more detail, followed by advanced integration with heart IO and then full integration. So we'll see what these look like. Okay, basic integration. What does that mean? It means that the PLC's IO modules do not have a heart modem. And basically what that means here, if I had a digital input card or a digital output card, if it's not got the heart brand on it somewhere, it's just a regular analog input card and it will offer you nothing beneficial from a heart transmitter. You need to have the heart modem uh, either as a, as a handheld device or built into the card in order to communicate with a heart device. Okay, basic integration with heart I.O. That basically just means that it has, like I said earlier, these heart I.O. modules that can access that additional data uh, such, such as faults and status and things of that na nature. Primary variable with uh, heart I.O. is still access over quota 20. Still need to use the communicator to uh, configure. Advanced integration with hard I.O. Digital primary and secondary variables now come into play along with all that other status data. Okay, we still need the heart communicator to do all of this stuff. Full integration. Here we're saying that we're, we've bought into heart absolutely and completely. Um, it allows for configuration and devices and the collection of diagnostics from an asset management system. And things like uh, AMS uh, is a popular program that is used as a data or an asset management system. AMS is owned, I think, by uh, Spartan, Rosemount, Fisher, whoever it is, that's their, that's their version, but it's asset management. And it's basically saying that it's fully integrated, built into our PLC program, all our computers can talk to it through a network card, and this is what we've got uh, basically done in the lab, and any site will probably be the same way. K-Heart multi-drop, not as common as point to point, uh, slower update rates, uh, and they require, require, of course, a special module that allows us to multi-drop. Not that common in heart. I've never, I've never personally been on a site that has had heart multi-drop, but then I'm pretty old, so what do I know? Okay, foundation field bus highlights again two networks: the high-speed end, which is from the from the proce uh, from the processors to the engineering stations and even into the offices, and then. Uh, uh, H1, H1 network, which is the field device network. The magic piece of equipment in here is that foundation field bus linking device, which is the link between our low end network and our high end network. So it's similar to the similar to the card. Okay, control being done in the PLC, uh, illustrated on the top here. So within our CPU, we have our function blocks that we have in our software that's associated with our controller and our uh, Logix 5000 or Delta V, whatever it is. So control being done in the PLC, but again, foundation field bus being unique in that we can also do control in the end devices. And that is probably the most significant difference between foundation field bus and any of the other protocols is that we can set up PID control using the analog input block of the transmitter and the analog output block inside the field device. Okay, so uh, there, there again, basically, um, repeat of last slide, the last slide had both of them, this one just has the field device control side. 
Okay, redundancy. Uh, haven't talked too much about redundancy, and uh, we're going to, unfortunately, talk about, about redundancy uh, later on. Redundancy, again, is just having a backup available, uh, depending on the process, may or may not be required. If you're making big bucks, your Syncrude, your Suncor, your Nova, uh, any oil field company that's making thousands and thousands of dollars a day, it's worth money to have uh, doubles, basically, of everything to allow you to maintain production in case, uh, you know, crap hits the fan and you start losing equipment. Okay, redundancy is a parallel or secondary system that takes over when the primary system fails, so that control is continuing uninterrupted. The amount of redundancy is based on the availability needs of the system. So how important is it to you to have redundancy? We define that in the ILM in terms of basic availability, high availability, and fault tolerance. And you will be asked to define situations. I'll give you a situation and say this this happens. What does it define? Basic, high, or fault tolerant? Okay, so basic satisfies only the basic functional requirements of the process and will work well as long as no faults occur. A fault in the controller will result in all modules going into their fail safe. So very basic, very fundamental. Again, building again as we go along here. High availability, by definition, says a fault in the primary controller. And you can see here that we have primary controller and we have a secondary controller, both connected to our network. So. Power supply or network modules, uh, if they fault, will cause the secondary to take over without shutting down. This process of switching from one to the other is called cross-loading and switchover. So yellow, again, refers to a self-test question. So something happens with the primary, it will automatically switch over to the second, which is connected to all our I.O which will mean our fuel devices will still keep working. We can go back, we can fix this thing, and switch it back when we get it working. Last uh, conditional or last package uh, of dealing with problems and redundancy here is called fault tolerance. And you can see it's uh, a little bit more involved than the previous two here. And a fault tolerant PLC system will prevent a critical process from going down for any reason and the distinguishing point here says a fault can be repaired without interrupting the process so redundant engineering stations redundant controllers redundant switches redundant network cards redundant io everything is redundant so that's most critical processes most big dollar places will work on a system like this Okay, learning objective, describe safety considerations when making changes online, forcing, disabling, and bypassing I.O. And this is something that I know personally I'm not uh, strong on when we're in the lab, and that is really the place to uh, exercise this when we're down in the lab. We can do whatever we want. There's no consequences. Lights will come on. We don't have anything to really worry about, so we kind of go about it. Um, all really nearly. And next time we go to the lab, I'll talk about this um, a little bit more. Um, it all has to do with how we're doing our programming, whether we're in remote run or run or offline or online. Um, we got to be careful is what it basically comes down to. Um, in the lab, there's no consequences, but in real life, uh, there is. So we have to learn about what happens in the in the different modes, you know, when we turn the key from a remote program to run and all that kind of stuff, we have to be fully aware of the effects that we're having on the system. Okay, so online edits is largely what we are doing uh, in the lab, which means that the the processor is running, uh, it's doing whatever it's doing, and we're in there in the ladder uh, logic messing around with things here. So always do uh, these things here before editing online. Assess the possible scenarios. How is what I'm doing potentially going to affect 
what's going on outside when I hit that download button. Notify operations that you're up to no good. Uh, if they're aware of it, they'll be more likely to run out there and uh, fix any of your mistakes in a timely fashion, or at least they'll be prepared to know that something could be coming down the pipe. Upload and save current configuration. This is always the first thing that you should do. Uh, you come into the uh, workstation and you sit down, you you upload and you save it. You do that first every single time. If anything goes south, at least you can put it back to where you had messed it up before you call the contractor in. Okay, so steps to follow if we were doing this properly in the lab and actually you guys kind of do this without even knowing it. Um, start a pending edit. You guys don't know what that looks like, and I'll show you in the lab, but there were some buttons up on the on the screen, and a couple of the groups I, I came around and I showed you. We usually just make changes, and then we go straight to download, and we download them, and that's okay in the lab. Um, but the pro proper process involves um, making a pending edit, and then accepting the edits, and testing the edits, assembling the edits, and saving the edits before we download it. And actually, there's a button, or there's two buttons, actually, that perform all of these functions uh, in the in the PLC before we're supposed to download it. So we'll look at that next time we go into the lab. Um, this image here kind of is a throwback to the old PLC uh, 515s, uh, the older stuff. Um, but this is usually a, a key, a physical key that you'll find on the controller. Uh, and the reason that you have that key on there is because it's easy for any Yahoo to sit down at the workstation and put it into a remote or a program or run. But if it's actually out in the field and you've turned the switch with the key and you've taken away the key, then they can't, they can't do that even from the processor. So that's where that comes into play. But we don't really exercise that in the lab, but I will show you next time. Um, yeah. Not a great graphic to show here, but basically you're saying uh, we've got a we've got an error in our program and we need to fix it. So what do we do? We go into edit, and then we get what happens is the screen changes. So we get our original run. This is what what run two originally looked like looked like, and it's represented by an R or something in that particular software program. It may not be an R, it could be something else, but it'll indicate. The original rung, which is this one, and then our edited rung, which looks like this. So we, we get something like this, and then we go and we go accept edits. We hit a button at the top of our programming screen, and it would run through here and, and tell us if there's any errors. If there's any errors, it would tell us down in the lower window. But this is a pending edit, basically, is what we're showing here. Okay, then we accept or test the edit. The I indicates that we've accepted the edit, and the D Again, represent the indicated law, uh, the original logic. In test mode, the PLC, suite, uh, PLC will switch and execute that accepted edit. So it's just a function. We'll work through this again as uh, we go through the lab. And I got a note down here that that D should actually be a capital R. Uh, it was a lowercase r here, so it should have been a capital R in there. I know, is your graphic changed for that in the ILMs? You guys can come in. Showed out if that graphic has changed. It's a capital R. It's a capital R. Okay, perfect. Thanks. Okay, and then finally, what we do once we get to that uh, that that step there, we've uh, accepted our edit, edits, we've uh, tested our edits. Now we're going to assemble the edits, and assembling makes those um, edits permanent. And then it, we save it, and it backs it up on the PLC or the PC, and then we're we're all done our business. Forcing is something that we haven't done, and I'll get you guys to do this in the next lab too, but forcing is a great tool for testing the logic or checking the wiring to an output or temporarily running a process when an input fails. Um, up in the top left-hand corner of the Logix 5000 software, and again, I'll show this to you guys in the, in the lab, there is a force indicator that will let you know if, that there, if there's any forces that are on or not. And you can click on that and it'll tell you which which tags or which data points are forced um, so that you know. Forcing is a great tool for startup and commissioning, 
but a very dangerous tool in a running plant. Um, most of you won't know this, but um, I've been guilty a couple of times of flooding the three-phase separator that's downstairs in the lab. And I'll talk about it when we're down in the lab there, but we have a, a little workstation for the three-phase separator that's kind of hiding uh, behind the bench by the distillation column and you can't really see what's going on at the separator. And um, anyway, long story short, I forced a couple of uh, level outputs on the three-phase separator because it wasn't working properly and I wasn't paying attention and I overflowed it because I had the level alarms forced off. So you got to be careful with forces is long story short. Okay, same thing. Uh, same thing with disabling and bypassing, which are kind of often interchangeably used with forcing. Um, forcing changes an I.O. point in the field, however, rather than PLC programming. So forcing or disabling is like you going out and taking the two wires on a, on a level switch and, and jumpering them or something like that. We as instrument guys typically won't do that, hopefully, but operators have been known to do stuff like that. So uh, disabling and bypassing, again, might get you through a, a short-term problem, but do not forget about it. Um, there's better ways to do things. Forcing, as an example, would be a better way than uh, going out in the field and disabling or bypassing a device. Objective, objective six here was change management. Um, and this is big deal in some facilities and no deal at all uh, in other facilities, but basically it's the process of documenting anything that you do to the system. Uh, and the reason that we do this is because you could die tomorrow and someone is going to come in and have to figure out what you've been doing uh, with the program. So uh, it can involve things like having a folder uh, a folder in a computer that has all the changes that you've done, copies of the programs on certain date, backups, all that kind of thing. Uh, it could be uh, a logbook. Uh, when I worked for the wastewater treatment plant, we had our little workstation uh, tucked away in a little room and we just had a binder. And anytime someone came in, uh, you'd write the date on there, who it was, uh, what program you were playing with, what run you edited, what edits you made, things of that nature. So uh, change management could be as simple as that to a long drawn out process depending on uh, who your employer is and what standards that they have. Uh, if they're big money, big money employers, they'll have a change management system, uh, which is used of course to protect all their assets. Uh, if, if they don't have a system, they'll use, have, usually have some type of a, a, you know, an SOP, a standard operating procedure uh, that you have to follow. Okay, a change management system basically is, is there to mitigate risks and it's designed to protect, uh, protect against human error, so your mistakes, equipment failure, power interruptions, disasters, uh, sabotage, all these things are uh, considerable dangers to a, a facility. Um, if we were in class, I think I would have pulled up a, a YouTube video. There was a there was a situation actually when a disgruntled employer knew that the control network for a, a facility was not uh, security protected in terms of logons, and he was able to sit outside the gate of his facility that he no longer worked at and mess with the control system and, and shut everything down. So part of the change management system is there to, uh, you know, cover our asses and change management systems are, are there to, you know, document everything that's, that's happened. Okay, features of the change management system here, backup archives again, dated program backups, and they should occur periodically or whenever a change is made. Uh, a lot of these PLC software packages like uh, Logix 5000 will do this automatically every day. Uh, you may have heard of programs like uh, iFix Historian or other software packages that do that. Basically, it's a, uh, a data server that may be connected in parallel with your, you know, your workstation, and it will continuously back up, excuse me, all the time or whenever a change is made. Change auditing 
Now, basically, uploading that PLC, programming it, uh, program and compares it to a master copy, and it will identify any changes. And again, most modern software packages uh, like Logix 5000 or Windows uh, programs like Word, for example, you can take a document and another document, and you can put them up on a screen beside each other, and it'll show you what changes have been made. Access or secure access, again, um, haven't talked about that much yet. I'm not sure if it's in this ILM, we'll see. But this has to do with uh, logins, similar to uh, how you guys were not able to log into the uh, Logix 5000 software in the lab. I had to get you added onto a list. This is uh, exactly what we're talking about here, is secure access and restricting access to those who need to have it and eliminating the people that don't need to have it so that we have less changes and less things to worry about. So that's kind of a long dirty of, uh, you know, integrating uh, different languages into the PLCs and the software and hardware that's required and then the basic structure of your average PLC. Sir. So five programming languages outlined in uh, 611.31. They can all be used in different applications. They can all be integrated together. Um, PLCs can use DeviceNet, Heart, or Foundation Field Bus, or you can have DeviceNet, Heart, and Foundation Field Bus all in the same, all in the same cabinet. Online edits, forcing, and bypassing must be carefully used. And oops, change management systems are there to protect assets and assets. And that is that PowerPoint there. So that's it. That's the first time I've ever done one of these uh, online PowerPoints and recorded it. So hopefully that worked out for you guys. How'd that go? Not bad? Good. Good. We got one, two, six out of ten of you. That's not bad. Yeah, I think it was pretty good. Who didn't uh, who didn't make it? Got Jerome, Nicholas, Chris. It says plus four, but it won't show me plus four somehow. Uh, the other Dylan. Okay. Yeah. The other Dylan and Agnes. Okay, so let's see here now. 